I was like, turned to my then, now ex-girlfriend. I'm like, I'm gonna give everything away and go around the country and serve people. She slapped me because she was like hoping to have a proposal. A doctor friend of mine, he came to me and he's like, you're running away from life. My father said, I forbid you from doing this. I lost 75% of my friends. It was the most painful experience. So why did you go into ministry? Like you, you were a youth pastor. What, what drew you to that? Oh, wow. You have done your research. <laughs> yes. Um, so in my family, it was a big deal to get through the eighth grade. Like I come from backwoods people. I built a log house off the land. I'm a country boy. And so I built a log house, a stack wall home. When I was in grade eight, I had to strip cedar logs because we oh. literally cut them 16 inch lengths, mixed the mortar, built by hand a stack wall home out in the country too. <laughs> I, uh, I, that's, that's cool. Yeah. So I, I built, uh, you know, worked on two different log homes and a couple log barns. And so I like, know the strategy and the ancient te old techniques and newer techniques. So kind of grew up with that. And uh, I grew up with, in a foster home, my natural parents are foster parents. So I'm not a foster kid, but I have 39 foster sisters, 11 foster brothers, and kind of went through seeing how some of those, the lives that would be changed by the love of my parents. And, and some of them, which, you know, knowing the damage that was done, like, Oh my gosh, that it, it was, uh, you know, some horrible experiences were completely transformed. You never know which ones would be. You just try your best. And then, let time tell you the answers. Well, going off to college, it was a big deal for me to just graduate high school, have all my teeth. Why? Like, why? Just because of where you grew up and everything? Like just the level of poverty, all that stuff? Not so much level of poverty. Um, country folk, man. Like oh, just I lower grew up, standards, different standards. I grew up different. where there's either, like you either don't have teeth because you took meth or maybe you just were never taught to brush them. <laughs> and they're like, ah, you know, I didn't brush them, fell out. Okay. <laughs> like out in the woods, when you grow up, uh, there's a different way of being. So when you're in the city, it's a very transactional culture and it's very left brain. But when you're in the country, it's very much more like indigenous cultures to where it's an interactive culture, more right brain relational. And so it's a completely different skill set so because everyone has guns out there. You don't go up to someone's house unless you know and have a reason. Uh, but if you have a reason and you go up and you connect, you may become friends for life. So yeah, that's, that's where I grew up. So um, anyway, with service going into ministry, my, my dad was a minister and shouldn't have been. Mm. Um, he basically like found God and then was like, I'm going to preach and, and like didn't know anything. He was like preaching, just messing things up completely wrong. My mom was like, oh my gosh, I'm married to this man, but uh, keep the smile up. And, but he started a church that actually is still successful to today. So you're a PK. But, yeah. Yeah. I'm a PK. And, but the difficulty is, and I actually write about this in my book. I have a book about breaking patterns of generational dysfunction. I would watch my dad preach from the pulpit and then he would beat me before then and then come home and beat me again. Hmm. And your father gives you your connection to the outside world. Your mother gives you a connection to your internal world. So throughout, you know, life and kind of learning these things, I realized okay, my father gave me my connection to the external world. And he saved these kids from a life he had, but he's always been jealous of me. And he's always intentionally tried to hurt me, which drove me to a point of suicide when I was 11 and did a lot of work. But then, the, you know, the joke, how the joke's funny, maybe the joke's funny to everyone, but not necessarily the person that the joke was on. Mm -hmm. Like being brilliant at that, like that's my dad. So having that like provocateur, jester, wicked sense of humor, I grew up with it and, and the best, it's the best medicine. You know, my dad was also a fire chief, a fireman. So like that levity. So I grew up with that, but like, holy cow, like seeing how a youth 
could be fractured through like crude touch, the soul. Um, I had sisters with split personalities, bipolar disorder. Um, you know, you sit at the breakfast table and like, that's your like mental wellness <laughs> like checklist of like what could happen. I think this is why people struggle with religion and I won't say faith or spirituality, but with religion is because pastors have the ability to say, listen, I'm only human and I'm working, I'm, I'm working just like everyone else. Mm. But then they speak from a position of authority and I, I've heard others speak about it. Right. You know, like, like when I, when I went to church, I would always be careful in the parking lot, not to cut people off, you know, even though out on the highway, I'd be like, well, what are you doing getting in front of me? But oh, no, it's, yeah, Sunday. Yeah. it's Sunday. It's like, no, no, yeah. you first. No, you first. And you're trying oh, yeah. to out gracious one another. And then you go home and real life kicks in. And so it's like, it bothers me that, you know, and I know this isn't a religious podcast or anything like this, but it bothers me that, that people can stand up and say one thing, go home and do another thing and then rely on like, well, I'm a broken person. That honestly, that was exactly what happened to me. So I studied this stuff my whole life. It's been beat into me my whole life. Dad was Southern Baptist minister, mom, good heart, sweetest woman in the world. Uh, she wanted a big family biologically couldn't and was basically dumped with these foster kids and just loved them and helped them best she could. She was a, 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 a nurse, but had charge nurse for a neurology clinic. So she would explain to me about the brain and what would happen with different people and why their history. Cause like half of my sisters were prostitutes. Hmm. So like I went from like being a sheltered kid in a church to finding out which way to cut your wrists if you really want to die. And so like, as a seven year old, you're like, Oh, that's uh, not down the road across the street. That's a cry for help. That's not a real, that's not a real shot. Like that's where my mindset was because anything that you become familiar with becomes not a big deal. And most people aren't familiar with like um, the suicide and mental illness, mental watch, you know, those types of things. And I didn't even realize how familiar I was, but like when you grow up with it, you can't get away from it. It just becomes like, Hey, in fact, I just uh, gave a talk to um, the San Joaquin Valley department of education. And they asked me a very pointed question. Like, Hey, we, talk with suicidal kids and do you have any advice for us I'm like yeah um and the reason why it was so easy my wife said it was a profound thing that i said so i guess i'll say it here just because I <laughs> please do please if you have the most profound things this is the place to share them okay cool cool uh, <laughs> don't, well, don't hold back it, don't hold back <laughs> my my wife said it and and, and it might I, I mean she's more right than me so i was like surprised it was profound i was like oh cool i said something great awesome man <laughs> Because, you know, I'm also the guy that farts in bed next to her. So it's like hard to sometimes candle both, you know, try not to. But um, so when someone is dealing with suicide, it's important to not treat them as if they're broken. Because it's a very powerful place to be there, to face death and say, bring it on. It's Bushudo, the way of the warrior. The samurai would say you'd have to live like that. Well, when you are in a dark place, you don't have hope. How do you stir hope? How do you germinate that? Well, that's through curiosity. Well, how do you stir curiosity within a young mind? Well, they're in this more powerful place than most people ever get because they're in order for you to, you know, the think big, be bold, say yes. You have to die to certain psychological hooks that are in your heart that have been programmed into you that hold you back. So you have to die to self, which is a religious concept but you actually have to go through the process, which a lot of people talk about and don't do it. And so, but by focusing on the strength of that position, speaking to the child saying, Hey, listen, the truth of their experience, don't, don't canny code and say, Oh no, it'll be okay. And, and it wasn't that bad. No, it was horrible. You know, your, your, a lot of aspects of your childhood were taken from you. Your innocence was taken from you. Things that shouldn't have been done were done to you. However, it's given you this unique gift that you can approach life in a more powerful way that most adults never receive until they're on their deathbed and they're facing regret. Because by you painting a picture in the future, you open a new neural loop and stir curiosity of what would you be like? What would life be like if you focused on your life with that strength and power 
and you use service to transform all your relationships into a better spot. What, how, how could the, the power and genius of you become something great in humanity? And you stir that curiosity, and by attaching service, it does give hope and shows you value intrinsically of how you contribute to the world, and it brings a person out of that dark place. And that's what being a youth pastor did for you? Um, that's what drove me to that profession because I, the reason why I could say that off the top of my head is because I've been talking to my brothers and sisters about not trying to kill themselves since I was three years old. And then when I was in that spot, when I was 11, the way that I brought my own mind out of that place was to study martial arts. And that's what made me think like, Oh, I'm not worthless. I'm a warrior. I'm a samurai. Yeah. <laughs> so like, like I was just kind of like rolling off what helped me not only dig myself out of the hole, but come from a place of power and change everything. I had a, a thing, people down religion a lot. And I think um, if there's just this one shift I could say that helped me is instead of looking it as obligation Look at it as ability because it's these people crying out from antiquity, trying to give you the best they got. They didn't have Xerox. They had part like leather. Lamb. They're like, Lam. it was lamb. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. It took yeah. a lot Parchment. to write something down. Those yeah. And then describe it over and over again. And only certain people were allowed to read and write and like, Oral, well, oral history, I guess, helped, but yeah. Well, yeah, you have oral history and written history. Oh, if you want to get a little bit into that, if you want to go into redo hard things, like, so I had, I had a, an external goal and an internal goal when I get, so my hard thing, and when you go out and we work out in the country is to, you know, you do the hardest thing first and then life gets easier, right? Because the hardest thing is done. Very so like pragmatic, you, very pragmatic. Yeah, like, yeah, like your thing is the key to life. Like, oh, do our thing first, still first, and then it, everything's better. But when I'm realizing, okay, I was involved with youth ministry and I was good at it because you're creating games to teach ethics, morals, and values to youth. And I loved it because it was also the way like I connected in high school to life. Like it was my fun time. Because I was younger than everyone, smaller than everyone, four foot 11, 100 pounds, 13 years old, my freshman year of high school. Because I started school early because oh, I could read and write earlier because my mom taught me at home. But then I'm like small kid thrown into a locker. <laughs> my name was Bubba, my nickname. I don't go by it anymore because chicks didn't dig it. But like I was this little kid and this football player throws me in my locker, Marcos Martinez. But I remember him standing over. Like, what a your bastard, name? eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, in terms of story, like he's like, "What's your name?" And I'm like, "Bubba." And he's like, throws me in and shuts it. And then going to my my English class, I go and I'm late. And I figured out when you're inside a locker, there's a little lever that you can just click and you can get out it <laughs> was, it, was it only took me like 30 seconds to find it because i was like looking but i remember like that was my entrance to high school and even though i was scared for my life what i think happens is people aren't used to being scared for their life i'm used to being scared for my life with my siblings i mean there were there were suicide attempts every other month we would go to the hospital we wouldn't be able to watch the to be continued from a team because, you know, and have to grab the Uno deck because Christy tried to do it again. Like she did six months ago. Like that was the routine of, okay, it's going to take probably about three hours. So knowing how you can affect a mind early and you can change it and and mold it and and then recreate brokenness like uh, what the sh uh, shabby shabby the 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 japanese art where they put gold and broken make it more mm -hmm. more beautiful more more perfect than it was yeah before but like being able to learn that ancient skill of a priestly class of 
teaching ethics, morals, and values to youth so that you transition them up through a place to where they are more contributive citizens. Like that is the truest nature of the profession. Whether people hold that bar is, you know, it, it's up to the experience. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is when a crazy thing that no one knows, um, what's it? Richie Wilkerson Jr., the kid that uh, married Kanye and 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 yep. Kardashian, he was in my youth group. Ah. I was a youth pastor. <laughs> so like in, in Life Center in Tacoma, but like I I spoke in Father's Day uh, to the church, uh, and and I was I was working at the church. I I taught college. I taught junior high, and then I taught college. And they didn't have a college group, and in junior high was over seven hundred fifty kids. And that was actually the first time, oh, it was the first time I ever spoke about what happened to me, the sexual abuse in the post And it made it to where, like, I never would connect. I, I didn't think girls would find me attractive. I didn't think, I never dated um, high school. I mean, the first girl that, like, approached me in college, super hot, I thought she was making fun of me. And I was like, there's no way. Because it was so broken. But then being at a place that every experience points you towards worthless, having that experience where you never think you're worthy because you have this, um, this innocence is taken. And innocence, when it's taken from you like that, it, it, it's when you don't speak of it, it warps your mind over time. So maybe mine happened when I was, you know, eight, nine. And then the person leaves and it doesn't happen again. But if you don't speak of it, when it's, when you're 11, is this, it plays in your mind. It's as if it happens again at 11 and then when 13, 16, 18. So maybe you couldn't stand up for yourself when you were a child, but when you become an adult and you could stand up for yourself and you don't speak of it and it plays in your mind, it's as if you allow it to happen when you're like a conscious willing victim. So it twists your mind. And so, um, I was asked to, a very transformative thing was I was asked to uh, teach. I was the first assistant junior high and I was asked to take over for the main dude that, uh, cause he's going on vacation. And I was like, well, what do I teach? Cause I'm a new guy. I'm like, just out of college, just trying to help kids. And he's like, oh, John three, go. <laughs> yeah. T- teach whatever you're going through in junior high. Ah. And it was just like, bam, to the heart. And it was like that silent voice. You know exactly what you're going through in junior high. And you know that 40% of the boys and 50% of the girls are going through that, up that at least 20, you know, 10 to 20% more by the time they're 18, but all sexual abuse by the time they're in junior high, these people are experiencing it. And so I, I spoke, I actually used the intro from Marilyn Manson's Beautiful People. <laughs> Cause that was big at the time. I know it probably wouldn't go over right now with everything that happened, but I, that's what the kids were listening to and it put them in that state, in that dark state that, that when, with that voices, like when you have a gun in your mouth and you and you hear certain voices to do it, do it, do it. And you know that those voices start when they're young but to be able to speak to those voices and then paint a picture, open a new neural loop and say, Hey, listen, I was there. I cried myself to sleep for 14 years. This is the first time I'm speaking of it. And then watching as you speak, looking at the crowd and having, it look like flowers because usually it was an unruly group, 750 junior hires. Yeah. But it was like a wave of silence, wave of silence. And it was a person in the middle, like a, like a, just any type of daisy, but a person in the middle crumpled up weeping. And then all around 360, their friends putting their arms around them, just touching them. And it was, you know, do not neglect the laying out of hands, but it was not a trained experience. It was a visceral human experience. So these kids were inner city, not a part of a big church. They were just getting there to get out of their world. And so that kind of set me on a path of breaking patterns of generational dysfunction because those types of things happened to my father. He didn't protect me, allowed that in the world to where it, of course it happened to me, forgiveness and like purging that, but then realizing, okay, I understand this concept, but how do I actuate it? 
And the one thing that inspired me is the thing that scares everyone I know in the greatest way possible. And it's a, something that Jesus and Buddha have in common. And it's when the rich young ruler came to Jesus. What must I do to enter the king of heaven? Follow all the prophets. Did that since I was a kid. All right, big guy. You so yeah. bad. All your sell stuff. All, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Give, give it to the poor and follow me. And if you break it down into the Greek, so I can translate ancient Greek. And it's a little rusty because the internet does it so much faster. than I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to remember it. I can Google it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's when you follow me, it seems like an arrogant statement. You know, when it comes across in English, but when you look at the ancient Greek, it, it translates to live in this fashion. I get rid of your stuff, renounce the way the world is telling you to exist, live by serving others, and then you'll get it. You'll get it. But I've heard, I've, heard it, I've heard it said that the reason that that is the advice given to that specific person is because deep within that person's heart, that is the thing that would be the ultimate challenge. And maybe your heart would be different and someone else's heart would be different and the, the mandate would be different depending on what it is that you're holding on to. Yes. However, I think it's a universal challenge to let go of control and people, mm -hmm. humans hide behind their possessions to retain an element of control. So they, you can hide. That's why it's more difficult for a rich man to go into, you know, having the camel to dive the needle. Yeah, but, the eye of the needle, yeah. But the, the camel, I mean, it really does, there's the eye of the needle to where you had to, in ancient times, there was, it's called the eye, but you have to get on all fours and, and shuffle through so the city would be saved. So it wasn't an eye, needle, and thread. It was a gateway. But it's that you have to humble yourself. You have to, you know, Indiana Jones, the penitent, penitent man will pass. You have to bow. You ha it's, a, it's an element of sovereignty, but the switch of sovereignty is from a me-based focused to a we-based community focus. But you have to die to yourself in order to like, hey, you're not that important. How do you serve others? How do you fit into the group? And then the synergy that happens so that's, it's a magical thing. So I teach corporations how to transform their corporate culture into cooperative community by using service. And, but it really came from, hey, how would this change me? Looking back, 2010, 2011, I had a business. I'd been in LA for 10 years. I wrote a book, Breaking Patterns of Generational Dysfunction. I got rid of three different sources of anxiety or of, of like limiting beliefs, like, um, uh, shame, you know, from what happened when I was a kid, the rage of, of losing that childhood, but that took care of itself through intention and repattering, rewiring and uh, insecurity. But I always had anxiety and I wrote this book and I'm thinking like, I felt like, are you a fraud? Like your dad was a fraud. Or do you really got it? The scariest, hardest thing that I could think of was the rich young ruler. Because I went from, I moved to LA in my car, dude. I stayed, like, I lived the dream and started. I mean, it was like, I'm a country boy. So what? I've got to, I'm protected and I'll figure it out. And I got a job and got a place. And, and then I, 10 years later, had a business. I was the managing partner of a post-surgical recovery facility in Beverly Hills. Worked in top plastic surgery offices, all the doctors had 30 nurses, took the nurses post or the patients post-op and I made sure they followed the protocol. So like promise money, had that business. And then I was on the weekends, I was the massage therapist for NBC's The Biggest Loser. So I, I teach high level touch and I was inspired because my foster siblings, you could break a soul through crude touch with a lot natural law of polarity says the opposite can be true. So what, how could you weave things together and balance the body, soul, and spirit with touch? What is that possible? What is, it's just a theory. But that's why I kind of got into manual theory. So I'm a structural integration instructor. I've been touched. I, was, I worked with, yeah, NBC's American Gladiators, The Biggest Loser. At the same time, I was not The Biggest Loser. So I was top of my game. Right. And right. Therapy. Top, top of the top of the top. And then top of my game, so two NBC shows, top of my game with uh, in, in business that I thought, but then I literally started meditating for the first time. And it was just like, your life is a sham. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you have no meaning. 
And so was, you, was the anxiety true then? Or was the anxiety you hold was used to things it. that didn't matter? I was used to it. I was used to the mental gymnastics that I had to do to feel like um, I didn't have something sitting on my chest. You know, yeah. like, no, I, I, could, I, I, I could, I have GAD. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the country, built, built a log home, had, had an abusive stepfather. Um, yeah. I mean, I can remember in high school hearing they had, they had someone from prison come in to talk to us. Right. And the person from prison was talking about um, what it felt like to grow up abused and the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I didn't know why. And, um, and ultimately I was like, Oh, cause I, I, I wasn't sexually abused. I wasn't physically abused. I was never hit. And yet I was like, I grew up in such a pressure cooker, angry, rage filled yeah. environment. My father was a stepfather, a stepfighter, or a, a firefighter. Your <laughs> dad? I, my stepfather was a firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad was a big time fire chief, but fire chief all the way through. Yeah. 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 Fireman. Men, mental health issues, um, alcoholic, angry person. Um, you know, I can remember. Brother. <laughs> so I'm hearing your story now and I'm going, Oh, let's, let's throw some anxiety on top of it. Let's throw yeah. some, like, like you could just keep stacking and I'm still on, I'm still on this side of it. I feel like you're on this side of it. So when I ask, oh. when I ask these questions, it's because I'm still on this side of it and, oh, our, okay. viewers and our listeners and everyone else is still on this side of it. And I want I'm to still, know how you that, got here. That is so beautiful that you said that. And <sighs> You're good. To, and I'm honored that you would recognize that. Because yes, I am used to such a high level of anxiety. I am used to, um, yeah, I mean, panic attacks. And, mm -hmm. But being able to, the rich and ruler hiding my stuff, addicted to control and controlling your environment. When you serve and you connect to another human being and you give chunks of time, you remove yourself from self. It's a, that's why it's the highest form of every religion. Yogis, Christian, Buddha, like all of them pretty much. Unless you're a Luciferian where you like study the dark Lord. And, and even then you're serving just it's like the Willie Nelson song. You're going to serve somebody. You may serve the devil. You may serve the Lord. You're going to serve somebody. Like service is the one thing that underpins every organization and institution. So whether it's hierarchy, left brain, or it's right brain, charity, to where it's like service of a cause. Like where are you putting your time and your heartbeats? Um, so the best advice I ever got that helped me most of all is when I was a, uh, when I was, a kid in church a pastor talked about how executives in Toyota think in terms of decades, not minutes, hours, days, months, years, but decades. Yeah. That was said to me just when I was a kid and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. I'll plug that into the old biological computer and allowed those words to imprint and quilt a, a pivotal milestone in my life. Well, now, 16 to 26, to where 26, your brain is fully formed, your, life, your insurance goes down. I was like, oh, I'm going to get educated, educated, just do whatever my parents tell me to do. So me studying uh, religion, it was to me to make my dad proud. He wanted me to be a preacher. And I, because that's what he did. And he was a fireman and I could have gotten into that. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I didn't feel worthy to speak not because I didn't feel worthy as a human, but like, I knew that like, Hey, I have this anxiety. I have these huge challenges. Like I got to square this away before I start giving advice. And then, so then 26 to 36, I went to LA, wrote a book and just started from nothing. And I went to Liberty university. I was student body president there. My first friend in LA is a gay guy who is a producer for a game show. It's on TV right now, Chris Ahern. And he was like, he basically was like, hey, I'll, he, was, he wrote me AOL chat. He was like, hey, I know you're coming to town. You don't know anyone. I'm gay. I know that you <laughs> were in this world, you know, but you don't have to be my friend if you don't want to. And I don't, it's right now, it's cool. But 
I need to know now. Otherwise, if we become friends and you find this out, it's going to hurt my feelings. And I was like, oh, wow. Huh. I'm moving to this new place. I don't know anyone. I was like, if you can handle having a straight friend, I can handle having a gay friend. That guy was the best friend, the best wingman, like totally changed my mind about who people are. So I'm moving to LA to rewire my mind. So I wrote a book, Breaking Patterns of Generational Dysfunction. So try whatever is given in, in, in love and in a friendship, like brotherly, sisterly way, hey, let it change you. Then I'm 36 and I'm, I'm wake up and I'm like, hey, I've Fix these, you know, rage, insecurity, shame, still got anxiety. And I think I know how to rewire the mind. Is that the have, order you need to go in or is that the order? For no, you? that's the order. I, I went rage first because my dad helped me do that. I learned how to use service because he used service to rewire it, kind of stumbled to enlightenment. I'm like, oh, wow, this works. Okay. <laughs> this makes me feel a lot less like crap. <laughs> So then it was when I, when I uh, went off to college, changing your environment. So my mom was, you know, was a head charge nurse for, uh, before she had a bad car accident, had brain damage for a, a neurology clinic. And so, you know, rewiring, she taught me about concepts of rewiring. So I, when I went off to, uh, when, I, when you change your environment drastically, like moving anywhere, you'll question your survival, which it gives you access to your reptilian brain which allows you to rewire your brain on a base level, your reptilian brain to your limbic brain to your neurocortex, executive function, both life you and have, right you, you have to You have to move someplace new or does this no, new no, vacation, just move it. this just, just any new No, moving a new to a new, I'm sorry. No, no, I was, I was saying just like, can, you, can I just place myself in another place for a week and still tap into this stuff? Or literally you have to pack up and- No, move? no, no, I'm not saying, I'm not telling people to move. <laughs> that's where I'm going with this. <laughs> I know, that's why I wanted to stop you. <laughs> I'm just saying, if there's any type of situation, so like right now, people that have moved because of the pandemic, I'm trying to give them the value. If they're in a new location, the pandemic itself has people, have people questioning reality to whether they can survive yeah. this moment, whether life is actually worthy of living. So the same thing I gave you, same thing there, they're already in a state of questioning their survival. So their, their brain stem, the reptilian brain that questioned their survival, whether, and that's why like, I look at this whole thing and I'm like, oh, what an amazing, beautiful opportunity to rewire humanity in a way to serve each other if we just use technology to track it and make it truthful, honest, and transparent so people can be seen by what they do. And then people can encourage that because they can leverage time and have it be exponential. But that's a, <clears throat> a cooperative community. So... Basically, I had this, I was a minister. I was like, what do I want to do? I want to write, I spoke in church. If you go to my uh, website, Give Back, I have the video from uh, 1998. My, da my dad and I spoke for the first time and we told all these people that thought our life was great. And my dad was this like hero in the church that saved the kids. Oh, by the way, my kid tried to kill himself with Russian roulette. And it was because I was a jerk. So we told the church that together and like 750 people lined up to talk to us. And like, they were all facing the same problem we had. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like I, and I promised the first person in line that I would write a book about the experience. I'm a C English student. I'm like, I don't know how to write. So I'm like, I got to go to LA, just learn how to write something like worthy. Cause writing something and then writing something someone pays for and is glad they paid for it is a completely different level. Yes. Moved to LA, 10 years. When I, when I moved there, just like in college, my mom taught me a change in environment to where you move. It questions your survival. So it's a trick hack. So if you ever move locations, use as an opportunity to rewire your mind. Use service to rewire your connection to that community. You can then set up authentic, deep relationships quickly without the psychological hooks of your past. Mm. Right? It's a strategy. Mm -hmm. So did it in college. Four years later, I went from never trying out for anything ever in my life, a, a drama team, a sports program, to four years later, I was student body president. And I didn't know anyone. I literally went to Liberty because the first day I said, who's the fat guy on stage that acts like he owns the place? They're like, that's Jerry Fowler. He does own the place. I was like, all right, go on with your bad self, big guy. <laughs> like, I didn't even know anything. My dad helped pick it. Oh, you'll like it. 
it'll be great. And, and but it, it was good because it was a safe environment for me. It was protective and I needed that because I was it was so damaging before. Fast forward, that removed my insecurity because I became student body president. I learned service in that community because that was the only thing I did. I helped basketball players learn math because I was in a, or, you know, just, hey, you're trying something here. I'll help you. Here's some time. That's it. Detachment of time. Moved to LA in my car. Just, you know, I invited to a party. I'm like, hey, you want to help clean up? Why? I'm going home to no one and nothing and maybe stay in my car. I ain't going to invite you back there. This is better than sleep in my car. And uh, I, during the time I worked for Alaska Airlines, I had a business up in, in LA that I was shutting down because I didn't enjoy it. And a small business wasn't working out. And then I was opening up a life in, in LA. So I worked part-time throwing bags for Alaska Airlines so I could fly for free. Work 30 hours straight on the ramp, literally sleep in a baggage cart in the back with a big stuff because I could fly for free. I was happier in my car in LA than in a fully furnished house up in Washington. So that's how I knew I needed to move. Mm -hmm. But it was like these gradual making uh, life changes to like, do I want to move to LA to write this book to give this information? Because I think it's true. I'm going to bet my life on it. But after 10 years, Went from nothing to, you know, studied touch because it was inspired me, the opposite of my uh, foster home. And I'm, you know, working well with that, with, you know, business. I'm trying, oh, I need to learn business to provide. Good with, but then my life was a wreck on call 24 hours a day. It wasn't fulfilling. It was a superficial life. A lot of the friends were superficial. And I was like, if I really know, and I had a, I had an anxiety attack, but then I broke through and I had this like peace and I think, and I was using service and I'm like, if I really know how to do this and I have to show other people how to break this reptilian cycle loop by using service, this underpinning of everything, but leverage in a different way. So, and the, what inspired me to trigger the getting everything. Okay. I have to change my environment. So 50 states. I served a family in every state across the nation for three days. I would make no decision myself because I couldn't trust my mind. So Benjamin Franklin, visitor like fish goes bad after three days. Okay, three days it is. Like, people were like, oh, your ideas are so brilliant. I'm like, no, I made no decision. But, <laughs> but then giving this, when I go to a state, what's the coolest thing I could give in time, a coolest experience I could find in that state and then let just record it with a GoPro and then said, Hey, pay it forward. Give so others give more and use that as experience. So I had the internal goal of removing PTSD and filming it. Cause I thought I could do it. But if I was wrong, I just end up in a van down by the river and I wouldn't show anyone the footage. <laughs> so, so explain, explain to the audience what you did with this, with this challenge. Oh, um, so I gave everything away. So the rich young ruler, the whole thing of the challenge, I was like, that's it. That's the scariest thing. The hardest thing I could think of the hardest thing to do is do exactly this. And so I had the idea December 1st and then I thought about it and I decided I would give myself one month to think about it. New Year's as the ball dropped, um, 2011, I was like, turned to my then now ex-girlfriend. I'm like, I'm going to give everything away and go around the country and serve people. <laughs> she slapped me because she was like hoping to have a proposal. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that she's like, how romantic. <laughs> yeah. And quit on scene. Um, yeah. And then so, so January to, you know, February, I basically, uh, made plans February 18th. I was like hijacking every major date that would make something. So I just Googled, Hey, what are significant dates right now? And there is a Jewish, uh, Purim every four years, uh, leap year. There is a, the, one of the Purims you give gifts to your friends February 18th on 2011 was that day. I'm like, all right. So I invited all my friends over and I got one of the pictures from it and they all came and I make a list whatever you want here. And then April Fool's Day, uh, I invited everyone to come back and take it. So I gave everything, just filmed it. And then just the stress and like a living funeral. So it's like a potlatch ceremony. So that- What, what did your friends What did your friends say when you reached out to me and said, 
I'm going to give everything away. Uh, a lot of them thought I was suicidal because that's a telltale sign of, of being suicidal. And I'm like, no, that was 25 years ago. <laughs> like, no, I'm over this now. I fixed it all. <laughs> full circle. Full c- um, so, yeah, I have um, I'm gonna, a, a buddy of mine who actually sells dehydrated fruit. Dope dry munchies. It's completely non. Can I tell you, I love dehydrated fruit. <laughs> I mean, random yeah. side, random aside, but if you want to eat a lot of apricots really quickly, it's the best way to go about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's food is medicine. Hippocrates, like it's it's important. Uh, anyway, he he. Uh, shoot, I totally lost my train of thought. So, what did your friends think when when you were going to give everything? Oh, away? he was friend? like, he was like, dude, why are you doing this? In fact, I I wrote about it in my book. Uh, 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 break. Hey, Dad, remember me? Is the title? It's on Amazon. But uh, just a uh, few pages of that conversation to deal with that because I had I had doctors that uh, a doctor friend of mine who came to me and is like, I cannot support what you're doing. You're running away from life. Uh, my father said, I forbid you from doing this. Um, I lost seventy five percent of my friends, and it was it was the most painful experience, but it weeded out why why i mean i can imagine i think anyone can guess but but let's dig into this i mean because i I, costing you so much to do this it pulled out the relationships out of the soil of my heart that i gave too much time to through my life because i was addicted to their energy because of some aspect of my insecurity or psychological hook or something that I felt like I was lacking and I was gaining from them because every interaction is a transfer of power. And so if you feel like you're lacking or you're not aware of something in your, in your, your bowl of power, is kind of spilling out, you'll get that from other people and people can use that to manipulate and control you. Mm. And I didn't realize that these people were, in my life for what I could give them in this aspect of my life that really didn't have any meaning moving forward. However, they still, I still had all these memories. Like I, I remember telling one of my best friends, um, one of, I, I would say one of my best friends at the end of my life, when I die, it's one of my closest friends in life for a period of time. When he found out that I spoke to talk to God. He was like, you talk to God, you talk. I'm like, and I'm thinking like, this has been told to me since I was born. Like my parent, my dad was a preacher. Like, how could you not know that I would do this as a human? Even if it's crazy, I can be talking to myself. I'm not saying that, that sometimes I probably do, but he's like, I cannot have, I, like that's delusional. And that mm. I don't want someone in my life. And to, to feel like, because when I was praying, I literally called out and I said, God, hey, I'm going to, and I only developed one page to my entire book, to my spiritual life. And I was like, God, I want to see your mind. I want to know your mind. Because I look at God as truth, light, and love. And I grew up in a house full of deception. And I wanted to break those neural patterns that that formative, those formative years uh, that created the dysfunctional habits that was limiting my life. And I, like, what do I do? I had to break every aspect of my mind and destroy it so that that's which is indestructible. A healthy system could then be rebuilt through service. So, you know, 40% of the people were friends, people I knew, because I wanted people to look at the journey and be like, oh, well, this person, you know, four of them were former Biggest Loser contestants. Like, oh, okay, well, maybe the guy did work on the Biggest Loser because, okay, there's four contestants. Or like a person from elementary school that's been friends for years in in, uh, South Dakota. So it's like, oh, okay, well, he's kept friendships for decades, so he must not be too crazy. But then 60% were strangers um, so that... I could rewire myself, you know, serving family, friends, foreigners, and foes, people I had beef with. Like when you use service, because it triggers mirroring neurons, even people that don't like you and you don't like. Like the reason I got on national news Christmas morning, best time slot of the year, without submitting a press release was because I served a foe someone I had beef with because it changed last minute and I helped him out. And this person really like 
probably, I don't know, over like a decade, 10, 20, 30 years, 10, 20 years ago. So I don't remember exactly like, did me kind of wrong, but we grow up, you know, we, everyone does stupid things. So I'm trying to find atonement and redemption for the historical problems in my lineage that have created whatever limitation, but then document it. And one of the things that happens is when you change the brain, it takes like six months. So you t- 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 look at rehab, it's like three months to break it, three months to program it. Then I thought, you know what? I'm probably going to not get it right first time out of the game. <laughs> so I, need a little, I need a little more time. <laughs> yeah, let's double it to a year. That makes sense. Uh, 52 weeks in a year, 50 states. Uh, that makes sense. Then I'll be trackable one year. Give me a goal. Press to it. But So it was more of a benchmark doubling. Can I prove this? And like, what would happen if I just did the work? Put everything on chopping block, just truth, light, and love, and let other people teach me the lessons of how to be a better man. That's it. Okay. And, so April first, um, April first. Every one of your, well, every one of your friends who are still friends, despite the seventy percent you're going to lose, they show up and they take all your stuff. Well, some of my people that that, that weren't my friends anymore still took my stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, oh, that vase over there. I think, and that coffee Thanks, table. I think and, I like that coffee table. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, Have yeah. Fun. Oh, that teak coffee table. Yeah, that's great. But the cool thing is, is as it was happening, I felt all of my psychological hooks, things that. A, you know, a year prior, I would have used my life defending. And then when you've given everything, it's easy to give all you got. I went going around the country, having this experience, you know, having, having it to where now, like the Navajo nation, like one of my buddies, good buddy is a medicine man. Whenever I go back, like I bring a few thousand, last time I was there, I was bringing like 3000 coats with a, a group of friends and like we hang out and we're like chill together. And, and the medicine man, mom, it's a matriarchal culture. And medicine man, mom was like, Hey, last time you were here, there, there's a ceremony and it was a rainstorm. And there's a, a group of boys like dug a trench around the teepee. So the water wouldn't come in and flood out the ceremony. Was that you? I'm like, yes, man. That was me and my friends. He's like, ah, welcome back to our teepee. Hmm. I was like, like having a community that we stole their land, killed their people, killed their, like they hate what the white man. I literally am the embodiment of what they hate. I can't fault them, but because of service, like how, and that's what my keynote goes through is the same principles. It transforms a whole community, how you can use those in any type of corporation. I use it in the most extreme circumstances possible because I wanted to push the envelope. Like what are the boundaries of this? What are the edges of, of the human being? So pushing itself for a year, but then in order to like reprogram yourself as a being, as a, as an entity, it takes seven to 10 years. So if you have like radioactive poisoning, um, you're all your cells replicate after seven to 10 years and you kind of become a new. So you rewire your brain six months to a year, boom. And then and I actually, <laughs> I actually added a second year onto it because after I was done, I was like, hey, wait a second. I can't let all the Mormons beat me. Like all the Mormons do two years. <laughs> so you want the two year mission? <laughs> the two year yeah. mission. <laughs> so then I'm like, okay, second year. And I just, you know, record it like what would happen. Cause I was, I had no uh, reason to come back quicker, but. So like right now I'm enjoying, like personally, I'm enjoying um, uh, Bonnie Ware, I think is her name, right? The, the five regrets of the dying. Uh Um, and I find it very interesting. Um, and the truths seem like truths to me, right? So the regret that, you know, I I should have not done so many things for others. Um, I should have pursued my true path. She shouldn't, you know, these regrets Uh that she collected along the way as a PSW, as she helped people with end of life. And so I read these and I go, these must be true. These must be true. Now I'm 38. Do I have to wait until I'm dying to realize that I regretted the decisions I made, or can I accept these as truths today and just hope to God that they're actually truths? And so when I hear your story, I I hear you saying like, I've collected these bits, I've collected these pieces. I have programmed out of myself anger and shame and I'm working on anxiety and I give everything away. What I see you doing, which is courageous to me and and I find bold and I'm interested in is, is you step out into faith 
And then you just go, well, all of these people must be speaking truth. I'm going to step out into faith. God, I hope it's true. <laughs> like, 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 cause you are, you're just hoping that these people who, you know, Jim Carrey says, I wish everyone can be rich. So they realize how hollow it is. It's like, that's great when you're rich to know that truth. I want to be rich so I can know that truth too. Yeah. Can I'd rather these... be rich and know that truth than poor and know that truth. <laughs> exactly. But, but there are these truths that I am willing to accept as truth because I trust the person who's telling me that it's true. But the gap is still, what if it's not? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So the, the true... And, and so I'm I'll, curious, I'll, I, I frame that all to say, like, I'm curious about the specific lessons the specific, through this journey yeah. that you learned because you stepped out into faith. And did you find that the truths you walked out in were, were, were made real yeah. or were they not made real? But that's okay because you found some other beautiful thing anyway. Oh, that's good. So the, one of the truths that was made real, the probably the biggest, most significant truth. And there's only one time where I kind of, uh, tap into this. And I, I don't think I've shared this before. Um, so when I was 16, the last time I talked to my grandfather, my mom's dad, he was a steel mill worker, regular common dude, just good everyday family, man. I was down in his basement in his little, little workshop and he liked to fly fish. And he was having a conversation with me. He's like, he had this like Marlon Brando speech, like, like, I, you know, I love my family, I love my life, but I, I could have done something. I, like, I could have been a contender. Mm. Like, that, like, box, I, I, that famous line. And the regret, and we talked about legacy, and that he felt like he loves his family and what he did with this time on the planet, but he didn't risk more and didn't, like, launch out there. So the, one of the only things that I have from my grandfather's cowboy hat. And so I literally had that cowboy hat uh, in my car, the only thing I kept in the car. And so it's like sitting in my, hey, grandpa, this is, and he's gone. I have his little bolo tie on my, <laughs> on my rear view mirror. And it's so like, it's like you're Wilson from Castaway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the only time I pulled it out is I was in uh, Shady Side, Ohio. And the lady asked me, <clears throat> she said, uh, hey, can you help me? Can you take my boys fishing? And at first I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'll study these fishing holes, do this, do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but why? She says, well, my husband was a soldier, came back from Afghanistan, promised him a fishing trip for years when he came back and he committed suicide before he followed through with his word. He jumped into a trash compactor. And this is not too long prior to this, this conversation. And She's like, I'd like someone to stand, a man stand in their place and say, hey, they're worthy. They're worthy of a man's time and they're priceless and, and just go fishing with them. And it, oh, I woke up that morning. I was weeping. So I'm like, man, I just wish my dad would have went fishing with me and would have wanted to spend time with me and didn't like everything I do, like, I didn't read his mind. So I was hit. Like, I know that I have minor brain damage in my cerebellum, my functional neurology instruction, my coach who teaches me things like how to rewire the mind with service and learning how it works was like diagnosed it. Like my left cerebellum, I have to do funky drills to activate cranial nerves because the way it was hit so much, but knowing that like, that needs to be rewired that legacy is at the end that these limiting things but having no judgment thing everything is perfect exactly the way that it is to teach me what i need to know that is the most important thing to teach me what i need to know because the universe and pain whether it's physical pain or psychological or spiritual pain goes at a one then at a two and then a three until you pay attention until it drops you to your knees and so it depends on how aware you are and your intention of stopping, meditating, slowing down, checking in, addressing that pain and going forward. But if you, if you're, Oh, I'm just going to suppress it, suppress it. Okay. Well then that's like, okay, your, your brakes are squeaking. Oh, I'll just ignore it and push it. There. Okay, great. It's going to tear your rotors. And it's going to cost you four times, five times as much. So everything is perfect. Exactly the way they need for you to learn the lessons that you need to learn. What are you missing? 
and have, be curious about that because that'll open a new neural loop to then you start exploring that. And exploration is the first level of thought. So attending to a thought. The problem is, is people start, they address thought in, in the intent to where you evaluate and determine before the intent, before you investigate and explore. There should be no judgment future tense only speaking and investigating and exploring. So you're allowed to, to uh, you know, cross pollinate ideas, come up with genius, because if you judge one thing, something that's really silly is genius when it's married with two other things. But if you have judgment on the silly thing, then you can't see the genius. So having completely removable judgment, everything is perfect exactly the way it is. And then knowing that legacy is what you will struggle with at the end of your life. So struggle with it now. So instead of thinking in terms of days, months, weeks, you think in terms of decades, centuries, and millennia as your actions affect your community and your planet. Um, know that people are inherently good and want to grow goodness in humanity. There are some that don't. <clears throat> and the way you weed them out is give them a small chunk of time, see what they do with it. Do they pay it forward? Do they grow it? Or do they just take it? If they just take it and be like, all right, but don't keep pouring into the same person before you know how they deal with time that's on you but give them a chunk because you the second thing is <clears throat> you'll never know which act of kindness will add to another act of kindness resulting in exponential good and that's with it my ted talk that's on my website giveback.com I, I bring this up and it's i was asked to pick up dog poop and i'm literally looking up to god being like i'm pissed i'm like i give everything away going out in the country follow my heart, do whatever you put on my heart without question or resistance. I literally pray, break me in every way I need to be broken so you can teach me how to be a good man. And you're, I'm picking up dog poop. How can picking up dog poop solve anything, do anything in the world? And then a poem, my mom taught me rang in my ears, so the charge of the light brigade. Theirs is not to reason why, theirs is but to do and die. And so I picked up the poop and let time give me the answers. Well, fast forward, few years later, I was able to get Melissa Karkowski, Ohio, whose kids I took fishing. Her dream was to be on, on one of those weight loss shows to lose some of the weight. I got her on ABC's Extreme Weight Loss by pulling strings in the background. The producers didn't know because I was working with the biggest loser people and casting directors that no one else knew. But being able to do that and being able to get her that, but it was because Two weeks prior, I was at Marcy Crozier, who was on The Biggest Loser's house, helping her, saying, hey, here's three days of time. What do you want to do? She's like, help my friend. That friend said, hey, pick up dog poop. So I'm like, because she hurt her back. She couldn't bend over. So I literally picked up dog poop all over. That's what I did for one whole day. But it created magic because I didn't have judgment and it synergized with another experience and another experience. So knowing that, you know, there's that. And then the service transforms every relationship. And I go through this in my keynote, like how you use that with your company, uh, whether it be family. So you can be working with family, right? Hardest thing to work with. Mm -hmm. Maybe the most beneficial, maybe the worst. Friends, foreigners, and foes. People you have beef with. How much does that change the office dynamic? People that aren't fighting, especially when you're in leadership. You're like, oh, can you just get along? You become a parent. Stop fighting. But it also has a profound impact on that person's entire community. Right now, I've, I've talked, uh, so the people that I've talked out of suicide, like 13 people, um, 14 if, you, if I include myself. Um, and we're talking like military. Guy took a, got the wrong intel, so it wasn't his fault. Friendly fire, mm -hmm. couldn't get over it. Mm -hmm. uh, talked a gun out of his mouth. And it was... Hey, the military leadership, my, my wife is, was a chief, uh, the head of security, chief security for military. She's a retired lieutenant colonel, former fighter pilot. Coolest girl I've ever met. <laughs> That's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> F1, F-16s, yeah, F-117, she flew the stealth. And like only three girls flew the stealth. She's, but, so she, but she keeps me in line. I'm more of a story first. She's safety first, so we're trying to get balanced. <laughs> Um, but yeah, her friend and, and um, it was meaningful because like all of these um, military colonels and they have a psychologist and have everything in place and you do all these checklist protocols. But then when it comes down to it, if it ain't working, 
Has anyone got something? Because mm-hmm. the something you're going to try is better than the ultimate end of what's going on. And so that's kind of why I get into these situations. I find out why, because I can speak to that because it's, it's part of my past. But being able to work with that person and take them from a place of 45 in the mouth to a place of life completely turned around and used service and did the same strategy um, and now have connection with leadership, military leadership because of that act of service and the time just given without like how impactful it is with everything, even if it's a stranger, even if the, the depths, like if you stir the curiosity, because the fact is it works. Every religion says it, everyone says it. But the problem is, we're saying the problem with religion is they have a lot of talk and they've read a lot of words and they try to tell you what to do instead of living it and just letting their life show you to where if someone shows you a good life, they'll ask, they wanna know. Like no, 100% of the people I serve throughout the country, I serve all religions, all different things, one different, weird, crazy, awesome. Like second day, what do you believe? Hmm. I didn't bring it up at all. In fact, I told myself, shut up. It's time for you to learn and be the student, James, not the teacher. And I'll let these people be the teacher. On the second day, they're like, hey, what you got? Because this is cool. And, any, and, and beginning, I had to hustle. I didn't even know if I could make it to all 50 states. I had 120 bucks, state four. Gave everything away. Why? Because, hey, I'm going to test humanity. Are, are we good? Is humanity good? Can we grow goodness? Is love worthy? Is God worthy? Am I worthy? I don't know. Let's see. Let's record. But because time makes things incontrovertible. And like the fact that you're sitting here, the fact that you're doing what you do, the fact people hear me on your podcast will give me a level of credibility because your time is incontrovertible. But you honoring the attention, like attention. So attending to something, that first level of thought, being able to introduce things. And then attending to situations. So you go from investigating, exploring to where there's no judgment, future tense. You go to a present tense to where you're, you're evaluating and determining. So it's narrowing it down. Get all the options, narrow it down, stick whatever together, get your brilliance. And then committing, you can only pick one. And that's where you're committing, anticipating like moment to moment and then anticipating benchmarks for results. So you keep service through that, but like making sure that you're not getting step two before step three, that you're allowing non-judgment. Okay. You don't keep a non-judgment all the time. You got to evaluate, pick one, narrow it down. So I think that giving yourself time, looking at things in terms of decades, um, allowing service to plant seeds. Like I did this work 10 years ago in my keynote, you can see how it transforms it. It's true. These are friends on my Facebook. You can email them so, or, or, or d- DM them. But like having it be to where you don't have to use the energy to promote who you are, but you change yourself, rewiring yourself. Those are the four main limiting emotions that I gave you. Mm. Um, and I had to hit all four. I don't think maybe someone's doesn't have to hit one of them, but you know. And then when you go through an experience how can I help you to the people that are around in your new environment, new job? You do what you're expected. Why, why mo- won't most people do this? Like, like I, I don't know if, I don't think most people would do this. No, they won't. And That's not? the best part about it. The best That's part why. is you, you just do it and, and you get to prove that it works. Boom. You want to go to the top? You really want to go to the top? Do this. Why? I'll t- use case scenario. You go in, how did I get to be the managing partner of a a post-surgical recovery business? What business did I have? Why did I give it away? I had no business doing that. I'm a structural integrator. I teach people how to balance the body using myofascial patterns, but I I flushed uh, anesthesia out of the body for the clients. I charged a lot, it was a swanky place in Beverly Hills. People that had rhinoplasty, you know, had anesthesia. So it's not, it's not like a body lift or anything. It's not like they had to worry about a bunch of drains. Um, but, and she got a little cut. I got paid well. So it was all gravy. The person got knocked up, needed help. 
purest form of religion, helping widows and orphans. This person was a single mom. So I helped my friend. And, but then it was like, ah, this isn't for me. So I gave her a year after the year. I was like, this isn't for me. I offered the portion of my company to the employees and just walked away. Um, just because, yeah, I was like, yeah, plastic surgery, not for me. But at the same time, like, how was I able to become managing partner, 50% owner of a business? Because I looked for an opportunity to serve. I didn't want that. I started the first day or first month and I was literally like, what do I know about this? Nothing. I just walked into plastic surgery offices being like, hey, do you have, do you want to send us your patients? We got a place. Uh, do you ever need backup? Sometimes. Do you want to use this for backup? Sure. Great. Like that, I, it wasn't a huge strategy. It was more of the country boy going out, figure it out, do hard things. We got to get clients just walking, not having the judgment. But service was the first point, service to a friend. Why, you know, even the, the other, I have a, a Janine Driver, who is a, a great speaker, movement pattern analysis. She taught me a lot of the stuff that I taught about the organization of thought. Um, but she's on CNN all the time talking about how, you know, Trump, when, who's lying when like the presidential debates, oh, he does this, he does that. And that's true, that's not. So I evaluating body language. Well, we became close friends through service. I helped her out with something. She helped me out with something. Like, and now we're close buddies. Well, this was through online, now in person. But it happens universally with powerful people, with not powerful, with humans. doesn't matter if they're powerful or not. So it's universal. But that, there is, there are some, you know, um, sticking points if you don't have boundaries if yes, you, I was I was just thinking that if you spent all your time giving and giving and giving and you're not very good at saying no, opportunities will come to you. The wrong opportunities will come to you, the traps will come to you. And don't feel like just because there's an opportunity you have to do it. Ah. Rarely, rarely if someone says serve me. No, oh serve you. If someone I look for people that like to serve people. And then I like to pour into them and what, because there's a magic, if we're really going to be thought leaders, if we're really going to have value and give value to other people, then we're going to put ourselves on the line. Yes. And you know, what will be the result? Something cool. Why? Cause it always gives something cool in time. It will grow something, but in picking someone, pick someone who inspires you, pick someone who you're like, and it doesn't have to be someone that, it, probably better even if they're not hugely successful, but someone that you're like, this person is a person that made me, that helped me be the human I am. I've got someone. I've got someone in mind. Cool. All right. An amazing man in mind. Okay. Oh my goodness. The, this has been the most fun. I mean, like, like we usually book an hour. I, I like to go long. I like to go long. So, so I apologize if you're over time, but we'll cut out this little part here, but let me ask you. So, so the last question I usually like, first of all, yeah, let me tell you this. Yeah. Take your apology back. I do okay. not receive it. <laughs> okay. We won't cut that out then. I will not apologize for the awesome time. I just want to be respectful of your, of your I schedule. appreciate that. However, I just got an agent. I just did my first speaking gig professionally. You're, I'm on your podcast. Like I'm just now getting out there. So the fact that you would allow me to share the computer screen with the, I, I looked at some of the other people that you got on your podcast. Like I was like, uh, Sir Mark, Marco Robinson. Like yeah, yeah, he's badass. <laughs> oh my God. I'm like, so I'm literally going to share with my mom. Hey mom, look at that page. She doesn't even know what a podcast is. I'm like, look at the name under there. Just play that podcast. So, I mean, with it, you've done me a huge service. So literally as I was approaching this this morning, like how do I serve? And this is the thought, maybe if it comes up organically, I'd say it, but um, the fact that, uh, yeah, you just brought me on, man, and, and gave me your time and, and gave me a platform and gave me credibility because you give attention to the audience that loves you, and I appreciate it. We've covered a lot of ground. We've talk, spoken about a lot of different things. But for you, I like, I like to know for people, at the end of the day, what does it really come down to? So you talked about your grandfather. Mm -hmm. You talked about regrets. 
uh, it, it doesn't have to be at the end of your life. But for you, when you just boil it all down to the simplest terms, it comes down to what? When I get out of the shower and I look in the mirror now, I smile. <laughs> Naked, dripping wet, COVID gut. You know, I, I look at the man that I became before. I looked at him and shook my head and said, you are more than what you've become. And now I feel like I am becoming the man that I should be. And I am that man, but I'm becoming more of it in more mature ways. So um, yeah, and service, service taught me that. James is a remarkable guy, isn't he? Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, service is a beautiful way to rewire your brain from past events and trauma. And other than the fact that James lost his girlfriend and all his friends, it actually led to a lot of deeper relationships. Number two, if you want to get to the top, do the things that most people are simply not willing to do. It's so good. Okay, and number three, time is an immutable currency. You can always trade time for money, but you can't trade money for time. So don't be so focused on money all the time. Okay, now if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult and the scary and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this man survived two rounds of terminal cancer, going on to climb Mount Everest and every other major mountain in the world. And he skied to the South Pole and the North Pole with only one lung. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring conversation.